Christ. Won't that be great? Oh, it's going to be wonderful knowing Jesus Christ. All right. Well, uh, you've got your Bible, I hope, and uh, we're going to be flipping around to a lot of different passages in, this, in the scriptures tonight because our topic is a, uh, a deep topic, and I'm going to do my very best to, uh, to share with you some of these things. Now, there, I, one of my greatest concerns is that a message like this uh, will, will produce more questions than answers. Uh, but my, my goal tonight is not to explain everything that's going on, uh, not to tell you what, you know, what all the, the, the latest news is. That's not my goal tonight. My goal tonight is to help you know and understand that Jesus is in charge, that he is the king, and that, is, that he is sovereignly in control. And I want you to see that the Bible is absolutely true and that the things that we see in the world today are actually uh, pointing to the truth of this book right here and you know when we look at bible prophecy there are a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives on it um, but if if we can just take the bible in a normal sense then we'll find that we can understand this book we don't have to we don't have to put assign special numbers and things and 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 th there's no secret key to knowledge or whatever to understand this uh, unless you're talking about the holy spirit who needs to give us wisdom to understand his truth that's for sure uh, but but really we just take the book in a normal sense as literally as possible and there there are places where it's obvious that it's figurative and the bible tells us that the Bible tells us things that are that are in signs, and sometimes it's not as clear, but really, we can take this book in a normal sense. Let's just read it in a normal sense, and I think we can understand a lot of what the Bible has to say. And so we're going to look at some scripture, some Bible prophecy. We're going to see what God has to say about things that are coming down the road, and perhaps we'll see, we'll get a glimpse as to how some of this that is going on even now is paving the way uh, for Bible prophecy. Uh, but the first thing that we've got to do is have a, a, a clear understanding of Bible prophecy. And it takes a lot of study. Uh, and, and you can't just jump into it and think, oh, I've got it figured out. And, and you're not just going to read the book of Revelation and say, oh, now I understand. No, the, the Bible works together as a whole. So we're going to start tonight in Daniel chapter 9. So Daniel chapter 9. Why don't you find your way there? Daniel chapter 9. And, uh, and I'm actually going to use uh, a, a PowerPoint that'll hopefully be a help to you uh, tonight, a, uh, a diagram that uh, hopefully will, will help to clarify and organize some thoughts in your mind tonight. So uh, Daniel chapter 9 is, um, is probably one of the best passages that you can go to uh, to get a a, uh, an overall glimpse as to what God is doing. Now, there's a couple things you need to understand. First of all, Daniel was written uh, by a Jewish prophet to Jewish people. And the focus, although we can certainly, as Gentiles, find a lot of truth in here, and, and he talks about Gentiles, but the focus of this passage of Daniel's uh, chapter 9 here and 7 and um, the focus is on what God is doing through the Jewish people and specifically in Jerusalem and how God will reveal himself to the world. And so his focus is on the Jewish nation. And we'll see that as we look at it. Daniel chapter 9. Are you there? All right. Daniel chapter 9. I want you to look at verse number 24. These are the words of, of God to Daniel the prophet. The Bible says this. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Now, let me stop right there. Uh, Seventy weeks are de determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. W who are we talking about? Uh, this prophecy is aimed at thy people, the people of Daniel. That would be Jewish people the nation of Israel. And what would be the city of the Jews? This is Jerusalem. So this prophecy is 
about the Jews and about the city of Jerusalem, but it encompasses all the things that we're going to talk about that uh, that are coming at the end of the of the end of the world, if you might think of it. Okay, now it says seventy weeks are determined. Seventy weeks are determined, uh, and uh, and you do a little digging, a little study, and you understand that the word weeks there simply means sevens. It's literally translated sevens. It's not. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean days, but it means sevens. So 70 sevens. And uh, a little more digging into the chapter reveals that the 70 sevens that he's referring to are years. Years. 70 sevens of years. So 70 times seven is what? Uh, 490. 490 years. The prophecy that Daniel is about to reveal is about 490 years. Okay, uh, what is the goal of this prophecy? Well, look at the verse again. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's a lot encompassed in the goal of this prophecy. There's a lot going there, um, but I want you to key in on a couple things. Think about this. To finish transgression, that's sin, all right? Sin's going to be eradicated. When? Well, at the end of this 490 years, and to make an end of sins, and their way of saying it, and to be recon, uh, to make reconciliation for iniquity, ah, to make us right with God, even though we have been sinners, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Everlasting righteousness, that's a good thing. Okay, so evidently this is a, a kingdom of righteousness that lasts forever and ever. Uh, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, to, to finish out the prophecies, uh, and to anoint the most holy. That is to make the, the most holy one anointed king. The Messiah will be king. Okay, now, so we're going to take time to look at this right here. This is a, uh, a timeline. And what we're going to see is uh, everything is pointing to the kingdom. Everlasting righteousness and the eternal state it's all going this direction, and this is the timeline for us, okay? So this prophecy now uh, brings to light uh, these 490 years. Now, look at uh, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again. So, uh, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Well, three score, that's uh, 62 plus seven, 69, 69 weeks, 69 weeks of years here. Again, don't be misled by the word weeks. It simply means sevens. So 69 sevens of years uh, is... Uh, the timeline up until verse 25. So uh, from the uh, going forth of the commandment to build Jerusalem, to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Well, who's Messiah the Prince? That's Jesus Christ. And you know, this is absolutely true. From the time that uh, the command was given to restore Jerusalem while they were in this 70 years of uh, captivity, the time that the order was given to rebuild Jerusalem until Jesus came riding in on the donkey, uh, these 69 sevens of years were completely fulfilled to the day. I don't have the time to go into all of the, the intricacies of how that happened, but it did to the day until Messiah the Prince um, came. And so then it says, uh, the street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. Verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So after that three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off. Now look at this again. Here we go. What we're looking at in Daniel is this prophecy 
that encompasses the 69 weeks of Daniel that goes on and on before this time period. And then there's the 70th week that we're going to focus in on tonight. So 69 weeks of Daniel plus the 70th week. The 62 plus the 7 is 69 weeks. Now, if you look back in your Bible again, you see it there. After three score and two weeks, that's the 67 plus, or I'm sorry, the 62 plus the 7 that already happened before that. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. So after that time period, you see Messiah will be cut off. Jesus died on the cross. He's cut off at the end of that 69 weeks. And then it seems that there is a gap. There's this break, a gap. And the Bible refers to this, uh, this gap. And you can see it in the scripture here, verse 26. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week well who the prince that will come will confirm the covenant with many the prince that will come that hasn't come there's a break between the 69th week and the prince that shall come that's future and so that break there uh, we have represented on the timeline here, and that break is the church age. This is the time that we are living right now in the church age, this break in the timeline between the 69th week and the, 70 week, the 70th week of Daniel. So there's this break, this break. It's the church age when Jesus returned to heaven and he established his church. Now, he established his church on the earth because the Jewish nation had rejected their Messiah. And so part of God's program, how is God going to reveal himself to the world if the very people he chose to reveal himself to the world through had rejected himself, Jesus? Well, that's why one of the reasons why Jesus sets up the church. Now the church is established on this earth. It's not Jew or Gentile. It's not rich or poor. It's not bond or free, but there's unity in the church. And we as the believers now have the great responsibility that the Jewish nation had to reveal the God of the Bible to the world. And so that is our job now during this time period of the church age. Now the rapture is all about the church. It has nothing to do with the Jewish people. But it's all about the church. The Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Re a mystery is a truth that was, that was hidden to the Old Testament prophets, hidden to the Jewish people, but now revealed. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be made alive. And so he talks about the, the rapture that's going to occur. Now keep a finger here in Daniel, and I want you to look with me at uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. We'll come back to Daniel in a minute. 1 Thessalonians. And I'm going to try to talk quickly because I know there's a lot for us to get to. Uh, and uh, I, just, I feel like there's so much that I need to explain. Uh, and so if you missed something and you don't quite understand something, I apologize. Uh, we can work towards getting as I'm trying to do a summary though. Uh, 1 Thessalonians. And I want you to look with me at uh, chapter number four, chapter number four, first Thessalonians, look with me at verse number 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ, the dead in Christ, that those are church saints, those are believers uh, in Christ. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. The word caught up there, uh, it, when it's translated into Latin, is the word rapture. And that's where we get the word rapture. It's not a, a Bible word per se, but it's translated 
from that word caught up. And so there it is, the rapture of the church, when we are caught up. It says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so at the, uh, at, in, during this interval, we have the, the church period. And the church saints are raptured up, were caught out of this world, and we remain with the Lord forever. And then God's focus returns to the nation of Israel, the 70th week of Daniel. Now, that has not happened yet. We are still in the church age. But the 70th week of Daniel is uh, what we refer to as the tribulation period. And there's a lot for us to understand in the tribulation period. I want you to go back now uh, to uh, Daniel chapter 9 because we're going to be there uh, again. Daniel chapter 9. During the 70th week of Daniel now, which we would call the Great Tribulation, it is a seven-year period of time seven-year period of time for the Great Tribulation. And there are some things that happen. The seven-year tribulation period begins when the Antichrist is revealed by making a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. All right, now, I'm going to get to the Roman Empire in just a minute, but the seven-year peace treaty with Israel starts the tribulation period. Um, the tribulation period does not start with the rapture. It starts with the seven-year tribulation period. Back in Daniel chapter 9, verse number 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Remember the context? We're talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel. We've seen 69 weeks. Here's the 70th week. The Antichrist, the prince that will come, according to verse 26, will confirm a covenant, this is a peace treaty, with many, that's between Israel and the many, for one week, a seven-year peace treaty. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. So he, he uh, signs a peace treaty with Israel for seven years, and that is the beginning of of the great tribulation period that Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And so the great tribulation period begins when Antichrist is revealed. Now, uh, how does he sign this peace, peace treaty? Well, Antichrist has come to power already as a coalition of a 10 nation uh, group. There's a coalition of 10 nations, and he is one of those 10 nations, one of those 10 leaders they are part of this coalition, and as a part of that, he signs a peace treaty. He organizes a peace treaty with those 10 nations and with others as well who will sign this peace treaty with the nation of Israel. We see this in Daniel chapter 7 and, of course, in uh, Revelation. Uh, but I want you to turn back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Back just a couple of pages. Look with me. Uh, at verse number 19. Now, Daniel had a dream uh, and he saw these beasts. These beasts represented the nations, uh, the, the world empires that were coming. The final beast, the last beast that, uh, that was revealed to Daniel was the Roman Empire. This agrees with history. Uh, the Roman Empire came along uh, and, and in fact, the Roman Empire, there's a double fulfillment. The Roman Empire had a part in destroying the, the uh, city of Jerusalem. They're going to do it again. Uh, it's going to be repeated. But here, uh, there's a double fulfillment. Here, this Roman Empire, which is the fourth beast, uh, is unique. Look at verse number 19. Daniel writes, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. Look at this, verse 20. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn which had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints, 
and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. What happens here is uh, this Antichrist is a part of a coalition of ten nations. He rises in power. He subdues three of those kings. The remaining seven willingly give over their power to this Antichrist. He rises then as the supreme leader of the entire world, and uh, and and everybody obeys. This is what happens. Now, uh, we see this. It, the, the correlation is amazing in the book of Revelation. If you want to look at Revelation and chapter 17, Revelation and chapter 17, and I'm talking here about the Antichrist when he's revealed at the beginning of the Great Tribulation period, makes a seven-year peace treaty. The Roman Empire continues in its final form of a ten-nation coalition. Its final form. Now, the Roman nation, the Roman Empire, by the way, still continues today. Every nation today that has any influence has a Roman-style government. Just as our nation, it's a Roman-style government. We have, um, we have a constitution. We have representatives. That's a Roman-style uh, government. And so the nations of the world today continue in this Roman-style government. It, so the Roman government really, in a, in a manner, continues today. But it's going to be, um, it's going to be coalesced around a ten-nation kingdom a 10-nation kingdom, uh, and so this will be this great Roman Empire that uh, rises again in its final form. Revelation chapter 17, verse number, uh, let's see, verse number 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world uh, when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now look at this, verse 12. Oh, this is great. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They rule with the beast, with the Antichrist, for one hour. That's a time period, a short time period. Uh, let's see. So they uh, they receive power as kings with as one hour with the beast. These have, verse 13, have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, that's the Antichrist. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Uh, okay, so this ten-nation coalition, uh, they rise to power as the Roman Empire. Now, they will be, uh, this won't be received willingly by the rest of the world. There will be other kingdoms that will try to stop this Roman Empire, but they will not be able to. And so this ten-nation coalition rises to power uh, as the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire then continues during the last week of years, the last seven years. Okay, I know I'm getting, there, there's a lot going on. Okay, so hang with me. I hope I'm not going too fast and getting too much. Um, but uh, we want to take a look at at uh, what else is happening during this time period. Okay, here, the Great Tribulation. Now we have the ministry of the two witnesses, perhaps Moses and Elijah. During the first half of the Tribulation, Moses and Elijah, I think, uh, the two witnesses, will be the witness for God in the world because the nation of Israel has not yet received Jesus as their Messiah, and so they're not able then yet to be the witness of God in the world at the time. So it seems that these two witnesses during the, the first half of the tribulation have incredible power uh, and uh, they're able to witness to the world through the technology that we have available today. And uh, they're able to witness to the world 
uh, and they are Jewish prophets. I believe Moses and Elijah come back. And, uh, and so now, halfway through the tribulation period, here's what happens. The Antichrist performs what we call the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation. Halfway through the tribulation, the Antichrist breaks the peace treaty that he had made with Israel and he claims to be God. This is halfway through the tribulation period. Now, you can go back to Daniel chapter 9 and you see exactly what is happening here. Verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one meek week and in the midst of the week, that's seven years, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Evidently, he allows the, uh, the nation of Israel to rebuild their temple, and they do. And they, they start performing sacrifices. Halfway through the tribulation period, he says, no more sacrifices. He breaks the peace treaty, and the nation of Israel can no longer worship God as they thought they were able to. What does he do? He goes in and uh, makes desolate that special place of worship. It seems that he goes into the Holy of Holies. He sits in the holy place, proclaims himself to be king. This would come from 2 Thessalonians. And so you can find your way to 2 Thessalonians. And, uh, and you can see with me here what happens with 2 Thessalonians and the Antichrist. Let me find it. I think it's still in my Bible. There it is. Second Thessalonians. That's first. There's second. Okay, chapter number two. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. Uh, this is a great help to us. Look at this, verse uh, number one. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that by our gathering together unto him, uh, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. This is so good for us. Uh, he says, don't, don't, don't panic here. Don't, don't worry. You think, oh, Jesus is coming back and we're all going to die. No, no, stop, stop, stop. Uh, don't panic, he says here. There are some things that have to happen before Jesus returns. Look at verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin, the son of perdition. That is a reference to the Antichrist. And in fact, uh, I'm looking here quickly. I took my uh, bookmark out. Uh, Daniel 11 verse 9 refers to uh, this son of perdition as well. Uh, Daniel 11 and uh, verse number 36. I apologize for verse 36. It says this, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that is determined shall be done. Verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of, his, of women nor regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all. He will go into that uh, holy place, magnify himself above all, and he will reveal himself uh, as God. When the son of perdition, uh, the Antichrist is revealed, then you know uh, the end is sure. Well, he hasn't been revealed yet. He hasn't been revealed yet. Uh, he is also called the beast in the book of Revelation. Verse 4, back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now ye know that uh, what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now this is an interesting passage. He that letteth, will let. This is the restrainer. The restrainer. You can do some digging here 
And, and, I, and there's a very good case, and I believe it, it's pretty clear here that the one who lets, the one who restrains is the Holy Spirit working through the church. So when the, whole, when the church is raptured out of here and the Holy Spirit stops restraining through the influence of the church, stops restraining evil in the world, then the Antichrist can quickly and easily come to power. So verse 7, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this, God, uh, this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, uh, the end will not come until the Antichrist is revealed. The Antichrist is not revealed until the Holy Spirit and the influence of the church is removed. The restrainer is removed out of this place. That doesn't happen yet either. And since the Antichrist is not revealed, then the mark of the Antichrist is not revealed either. And so nobody's taking the mark of the beast because the beast isn't here yet. And so there's a lot of conspiracies going on. There. Oh, this is, this is giving way to the mark of the beast. And the technology and perhaps the will around the world is there. But, but it has not happened yet. You know, it's been very interesting to see uh, what perhaps the mark of the beast may be and, uh, and how things are coming together. Let me just pause for just a minute here to talk to you about something I think is is pretty interesting. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say scary, uh, but I would say it's, it's interesting. Uh, there is a, a global think tank uh, that is very, very influential in the United Nations and in the, uh, uh, in the European Union. Uh, they, they are paid to uh, be a think tank for them. And, uh, and they are called, believe it or not, the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome. And, uh, and I, I have a, uh, a website here. I, I think it's interesting to note. Uh, the, uh, the Club of Rome, uh, let's see. I don't think you can see it here. Um, but we'll see it a, a little bit uh, later. But this is called the Club of Rome. Let me, uh, uh, let me go to the... Uh, first part of this website here. Um, I find it amazing that uh, this global think tank uh, has taken the name the Club of Rome. <laughs> and, uh, and I think perhaps this global think tank uh, will be working towards influencing the world uh, to bring about the rise of the Roman Empire. Uh, look at what they have up here. Promoting an understanding of the global challenges facing humanity. Uh, they're all about globalism. They're all about uh, a global response to the, the global problems that we're facing today. And uh, they have several different things that they've got down here. Climate planet emergency. The climate planet emergency. Um, they've written a letter to the global leaders of the world. One planet, one humanity, one health. Here it is. They've written a letter to these global leaders. And uh, they are begging and pleading global leaders to use this as an opportunity to bring about global change, to change what's going on. Notice what they say in this letter to uh, global leaders, a call to action from planetary emergency partnership, emerging, uh, emergency, uh, merging from the planetary emergency and partner, partnering between people and nature. It's time to harness our fears and build hope and drive action to respond to the human health and economic climate and biodiversity, uh, biodiversity crisis with solutions that build resilient societies in a longer term. Okay, they're calling us to action. 
Notice what they say a little farther down here. COVID-19 has shown us that transformational change is possible. A different world, a different economy is suddenly dawning. This unprecedented opportunity to move away from unmitigated growth at all costs in the old fossil fuel economy and deliver lasting balance between people, prosperity, and planet, uh, planetary boundaries. Uh, I, I find that really interesting. Uh, this, this club of Rome calling for global unity and uh, calling us to seize this opportunity for global change. And of course, you're familiar uh, with what uh, Dr. Fauci has said even recently uh, about immunity cards being discussed. Uh, coronavirus immunity cards for Americans are being discussed. Immunity cards? There's got to be some way, according to Dr. Fauci, for us to figure out who has the virus and who doesn't so that we can move back into opening up our society. This is crazy. Could it be that one of the reasons uh, that, uh, that we're all so desirous of opening the, the society once again in businesses, uh, could it be that this is all building towards uh, a, uh, a certificate of health, a global certificate of health? Uh, it's incredible. Uh, they want to figure out who's got it and who doesn't so that we can figure out. Look, look what it says. As we look forward, we get to the point of at least considering opening up the country, as it were. It's very important to appreciate and understand how much the virus has penetrated the society. Okay, how are we going to open society? We got to know where the virus is. We got to know who's immune to the virus. And so perhaps we've also got to know uh, who... Uh, has it by giving everybody a uh, some kind of a certificate. Notice here, uh, Dr. Redfield, director of the CDC. People are looking at all the different modern technology that could be brought to bear to make contract tracing more efficient and effective. Look at this. Are there more, if you will say, tech-savvy ways to be more comprehensive in contract tracing versus the old fashioned way. You know, currently these things are under aggressive evaluation. Aggressive evaluation of more tech savvy ways to figure out who's got the virus and who doesn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't have to remind you of the, the chip, you know, in the hands that's already here. Uh, I don't have to remind you about even the, uh, uh, the latest in technology, kind of a tattoo uh, that is only traceable uh, by uh, special technology and, and of course, uh, 5G technology and all this stuff. Uh, look, I, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories and all that. All I want you to know is technology is available. And, and things are moving now to where there is perhaps a desire and a will for some kind of global identification so that we can protect ourselves from the virus. What does that mean, Pastor Joel? Does that mean if we if we register, if, if we get some kind of immunization, does that mean we're taking the mark of the beast? No, I don't think so, because the beast isn't here yet. But will the beast harness this kind of technology? I think so. It's there. You see, the Bible prophecy is, is, is so true. Things are opening up for this. And it's possible that all of this can take place. And so uh, uh, the Antichrist will come to power. And, uh, and of course, we know that the, the mark of the beast, uh, as it says in Revelation chapter, uh, let's see, 13, the very end of chapter 13 talks about the mark of the beast and how uh, the, the Antichrist will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their forehand, uh, forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark 
or he that hath the name of the beast, the number of his name. And of course, um, here is wisdom. Let him under, hath understanding. Count the number of the beast. If there's a number of a man, his number is 600, three score and six. That's 666. And uh, okay, the mark of the beast. It's, uh, the technology is there. It's possible for that to happen. But I don't want you to panic because the beast hasn't been revealed yet. So his mark isn't here yet either. Uh, so uh, let's let's go back now uh, to our uh, PowerPoint and take a look at some of these things that you see here. Uh, the abomination of desolation occurs. Then after that, Jacob's trouble, intense persecution of Israel and of believers in Jesus. Uh, this occurs because of the ministry of the 144,000 witnesses. 144,000 witnesses are Jewish witnesses. 12,000 from every tribe, Jewish witnesses. These Jewish witnesses are sealed in their foreheads by God. They've got a different mark, not the mark of the beast, but the mark of God. And they are sealed and protected supernaturally because of the intense persecution that takes place during the second half of the tribulation period. This is known as Jacob's trouble. This is an intense time. And, uh, and there is still a witness in the world through the ministry of the 144,000. And so uh, prophecy continues uh, to build towards this. There's a couple other things I want to share with you. And I know our time is about gone. I know I've gone long, but I want to share a couple more things with you uh, that perhaps play into some of these things. I want you to notice uh, on our chart here, uh, that there is also the Battle of Gog and Magog. I don't know exactly when the Battle of Gog and Magog will be, but there's, it's very possible that it happens before the Great Tribulation, even paving the way for the Great Tribulation. This is uh, talked about in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, battle is a coalition of other nations coming together to battle the Roman Empire under the leadership of the Antichrist. The coalition of nations includes two very prominent nations that are all the time in the news and perhaps even now have a coalition already, uh, and that would be Russia and Iran. Russia and Iran. In Ezekiel, it's called Persia, which is modern-day Iran, and Rosh, which uh, is, seems to be pretty clear that that's referring to Russia as well. There are other nations that uh, take part in that, perhaps Libya, uh, perhaps Saudi Arabia, and they all come together to battle against the Roman Empire uh, under the leadership of the Antichrist. Now, when does the Battle of Gog and Magog take place? It's hard to tell. Some people think it might be during the middle of the tribulation, uh, but there's a prophecy in, uh, in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that talk about how after this great uh, battle, they will, uh, uh, they will be cleaning up the, uh, the weapons for seven years. For that reason, I tend to think it's back over here at the beginning of the great tribulation period. That's just my thought on that. And, uh, and you can see what you think. Um, but the, uh, the nations of the world seem to be coalescing. Uh, things are happening right now uh, that I think play into all of this. Now, what happens at the end of the Great Tribulation period? Jesus comes back. The second coming of Christ, then the Battle of Armageddon, where Jesus wipes out his enemies, including the Antichrist uh, and the Roman Empire. And then the kingdom begins from that point. Uh, that's what's going on. That's the program of God. That's the program of God. And things right now are beginning to build and the pieces are being moved together so that the reality is that Jesus could come back for his church at any moment. Any moment. Well, it could be today that we hear the trumpet sound, Jesus comes and, and we meet him in the air. Could be today that Jesus comes back. You know, 
uh, just as the club of Rome was telling the global leaders in one day, in one day, overnight, the world can change. And we've seen it through this pandemic. Overnight, the world can change. Everything shuts down overnight. Why? It's possible. We have the tendency to think, oh, no, these big changes, that can't, that can't happen in our world. No, it can happen. It can happen. And God can make it happen. And things are coming together. I don't say this to scare you. I say this to make you excited. Because you know what the Bible refers to as the blessed hope of the believer? The return of Jesus Christ. It's a hope. It's the blessed hope. Oh, I long for the return of Jesus Christ. He's coming back. And it could be today. It could be tomorrow. Because everything's in place. Everything's in place. It could easily happen. And Jesus could come back. I wonder, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus Christ? Is your focus on the gospel? We could talk about politics. You know, I'm thankful for our president that he's moving us away from, uh, from globalism. I, I like that. I'm very thankful for that. But no matter what the president does, he's not going to stop the program of God. It's not going to stop it. And, and while it's, it's beneficial for us in this country, and I'm thankful, the reality is Jesus will come back and the Antichrist will rise to power. And time is running out. We don't have a lot of time to share the truth of the gospel with somebody. Don't sit around and say, well, sometime, sometime, I'll tell somebody about Jesus. Do it today. Do it today. Because time is running out. And Jesus could return at any moment. And that's a good thing for the believers. All right, I know I went long. But I hope it's been a help to you in some way. Uh, and hasn't caused more questions, uh, that, uh, but has given you a hope that Jesus could return today. Let's pray. God, thank you for what you've shown us in Scripture. Help us please understand uh, this overview of Bible prophecy and help us to take heart to know that we need not be afraid, but we can be hopeful. And we ought to be motivated to share the gospel of Jesus with others around us. Uh, Lord, motivate us today and tomorrow and every day to focus on the gospel ministry that you've given to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thanks for joining me tonight. And uh, I will see you on Wednesday when we check in again. God bless you guys. I love you. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.